So I want to finish tonight on fixing broken relationships and uh, um, I want to pick up where we left off last week and we're dealing with this issue of reconciliation. Uh, we finished up Roman numeral four last week and I'll start back there, um, which is the message. Everybody say the message. Yes. The message of reconciliation. And if you were here last week, you will know that um, we are substituting fixing broken relationships for reconciliation so that it's more palatable, easier for us to understand because that's really what God is calling us to do. He's calling us to fix broken relationships. And so that's what 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is about. Um, let's pick up at verse 16 because I believe that's where we left off. And I'll read from verse 16 down to the, the end of the chapter and then we'll revisit it. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you. On Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's a good place to say amen. amen. Go back to verse 17. And so therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new. Everybody say new. new. So we left off talking about that we have to regard each other from a spiritual position. I wanna say something that I don't think I said last week, um, but I want us to try to do this. Now, it's gonna be hard, but I want us to make an effort at it. I want us to start viewing people according to their potential. Let's not view people based on what they say and what they do. Let's try to see them for what is possible for them. That would really change how we deal with everybody. When you look at verse number 17, if anyone is in Christ, he's new. Now we all know that that new thing in me, I'm not always living out. So in other words, God is really saying once I'm in him, there's greater potential in me, but then there is this battle going on to try to keep me trapped in what I was so that I never walk in the fullness of what I have the potential to be. And what is this? This is powerful. It, think of it like your children, for those of us who are parents. You, you don't speak, if you do, may, may, may the Lord, rep, may you repent. But we don't speak to our children in negative connotations, cussing at them and telling them that they're dumb and telling them that they're ugly and telling them. You don't talk to your children like that. You talk to your children because you see potential in them. So, so even when they don't get the best grades, you're like, I know there's something more in you than that. So we're always interacting with them based on what we know is in them. This is what I want us to grab a hold of as believers. The moment we get saved, God literally begins to activate something greater in me. It is so much greater that what I used to be looks nothing like what I can be. The challenge is sometimes I don't even know what's in me because we've been with us all along. So we know our proclivities, we know our thoughts, we know where we struggle. And sometimes, John, I don't even really, really see what's in me. What helps me understand what's in me is when someone else interacts with me based on that potential that's in me. And then what happens is we begin to live out what other people believe we can be. So what would our relationships look like if we started dealing with each other based on our potential? Wow. So I want us to 
to begin doing that. And that's the whole process of reconciliation. Let's reread it. And then I want to give you this next big point. Verse 18. Now, all things are of God who has fixed our broken relationship to him, who has reconciled us to him through Jesus and has given us, this is our next big point, the ministry of, break, of, of fixing broken relationships. Amen. Tell your neighbor, you have been given the ministry to, break, to fix broken relationships. Now, let me tell you what he's saying. Take number, Roman number five here. What he's given us now is the ministry of reconciliation. I want to say this is very powerful. Everyone in the body of Christ, assuming you serve, you are in at least two ministries. You're in the ministry of the greeters and you're in the ministry of reconciliation. And even for those of us who are not committed yet to serving in ministry, and I hope soon that'll be all of us, every one of us have been given that ministry to fix broken relationships, which means I ought not be an agent of watching relationships stay broken, nor I ought be an agent of breaking relationships. And a lot of times we don't recognize that sometimes where we lose our anointing and our power in our secondary ministry is when we are not faithful to our primary ministry. See, your secondary ministry is the praise team. The secondary ministry is youth investor. The secondary ministry is driving the van. The primary ministry is reconciliation, which means I don't want to violate my anointing to sing because even though I might sing good, I'm also guilty of breaking relationships, which means God is more interested in that we reconcile with one another. So what he does is he gives us the ministry, every one of us, of reconciliation. What does that mean? This is the sub point in your note sheet. It means that the ministry of reconciliation has been invested in Christians. So, so let me, let me, let me. So I can never say I can't do that. Because it's in you. Okay, let's go back and look. All things, verse 18, are of God who has reconciled us, who has broken our relationship to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of fixing broken relationships. He has given it to us. He has invested in me. I was reading this from uh, the Message Bible. Let me read it to you. This is from 18 all the way down to the end. He included everyone in his death so that everyone could also be included in his life. A resurrection life. A far better life than people ever lived on their own. Because of this decision, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. We looked at the Messiah that way once and got it all wrong. We certainly don't look at him that way anymore. Now we look inside and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start. The old life is gone, a new life burgeons. Listen, all this comes from the God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he has done. We are Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences. 
and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. How? You ask? In Christ. God put the wrong on him who never did anything wrong so we could be put right with God. That's so good. I I want us to get how we even got reconciled. Part of this issue of being reconciled in Christ is that God is saying to us, we can't be so petty into always pointing the finger as to who's right and who's wrong. That's a hard word. But the reason he's saying it is because he says, remember, What reconciled us to God is when he put on Jesus what was really supposed to be put on us. Which means if God created a reconciliation process based on who was right and who was wrong, we would never be able to be reconciled. So oftentimes what keeps us and prohibits us from being reconciled is we would rather just be right than to be in a relationship with people. And sometimes part of the Christian life, please, this is such a great word if we receive it. Part of the Christian life is giving up my rights. And so I want to, I want to, the rest of the class is your pastor's training and counseling for my master's in divinity program. Because I don't have a, a master's divinity in preaching or administration. It's actually in counseling. And so the rest of tonight's study is a master class on why we need to let stuff go. Because the truth of the matter is I have days where I barely can stand up holding on to just my stuff. I don't know that I have shoulders and back enough to hold on to everybody else's stuff too. And so what I'm gonna teach us tonight is that the person I'm hurting the most by holding it is me. And, and I may get to this, and when I hold it, I wind up doing me more hurt than the person who originally offended me. I, I, don't want, I don't, 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 let me just use the example. Let's use an offense as a punch in the face. Let's just, just use that image, okay? If an offense is a punch in the face and I refuse to forgive, once that person is long gone, every night before I go to bed, I'm punching me in the face. So now what is creating my damage is no longer what you did to me. It is my, unab- my inability to respond properly and how I need to handle what you did to me. And so let's learn, let's learn, let's learn, let's unpack this. So in R- Roman numeral six, I wanna talk about the method now of what is the method of reconciliation? What is the method of reconciliation? When I say reconciliation, I want us to also think in terms of forgiveness. So I wanna go ahead and clear some things up. Let's talk about what it does not mean because I can sense the heaviness in the room. It is, you don't know what they did to me. You you don't understand what happened. And so I wanna clarify some things so that we understand what it is and what it isn't. First of all, and I want you to jot these down, I want you to spend some time praying through these as we work through them together. Um, And and this is, I can honestly say that this is something that I can teach with ease. It's not many things I can teach relatively ease. One of the things that that the Lord has blessed me with is an ability to not hold on to stuff. I think think it's a necessity to have as a pastor. Because if you hold on to stuff, you won't never walk in no anointing, right? You just, and so you got to have the ability just to let stuff go. 
So let me talk about what it's not, first of all. Sub point one here. First of all, it does not mean the wrong done was acceptable. So when I forgive, it doesn't mean what the person did to me was acceptable. I want, so it's not a justification act. It's not saying it didn't hurt. It's not saying it didn't matter, okay? I'm gonna go through these quickly. Number two, it is not a denial of what happened. So when I'm walking through this offense, because I'm willing to forgive you, I'm not saying it didn't happen. Right, I'm fully aware of what has happened. Because a lot of times these are the excuses that we give ourselves. Well, I can't forgive him because I don't want him to feel like he got away with something. I don't want him to forgive him because I don't want him to feel like it's all right. So I want to go ahead and address all of these things that hinder us from our ability to do it. Number three, reconciliation is necessary to keep the wrong from continuing to hurt you. So I'm going to repeat myself because I want us to get this in our spirit. When I harbor, hold on to unforgiveness, I am literally hurting me. Who would drink poison expecting the person looking at you drinking it would be the one dying? Nobody would do that. You don't drink something to help us. Oh, no, I'm, 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 I'm going to show you. Let me, let me drink this. And they looking at you like, well, that's exactly what unforgiveness is. It is me drinking a cup of poison with the hope it'll hurt you. So I have to. And let me just throw this in for free. I'm not teaching this on the sheet tonight. I want us to be reminded that Unforgiveness is one of the biblical reasons that God does not answer prayer. What a tragedy to need to get a prayer through, and I can't because I'm still holding on to what you did three years ago. I need a healing today. I need a breakthrough today. And, and so the person that has damaged me has now, that hurt is recycling through my own efforts. So I gotta learn how to let it go. I'm gonna teach you how to let it go, don't worry. So it's necessary to keep the wrong from continuing to hurt me. Number four, reconciliation does not remove the consequences the other person will face. Um, one of the things that I think we all have to be mindful of is we don't get to determine the consequences. I'm, I'm gonna throw this in for free. I've seen this so many times in my 25 years of pastoring, or it'll be 25 years in a couple months, where someone will, particularly couples, where somebody will wrong the other person and they realize they were wrong, so now they wanna try to work out the relationship, they don't wanna lose the marriage, but then they want, I'll just use, say, if it's the man being unfaithful. So as soon as he comes to his senses and say, I'm sorry, he expects her to act like nothing ever happened. <laughs> so she could forgive you and you still be on the sofa. <laughs> oh, it, I, I should have more amens than that. It did, it, it, and, and so, and so we, 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 I'm not talking about no consequences, but I am talking about that I am not willing to let this weight stay on me to the point where it hinders how God is going to work in my life. So it does not remove the consequences the other person will face. And, and see, here's the problem with consequences. The problem with consequences is, let, let me say it this way. Imagine making a purchase, something you really want, and it's a price tag on it. And you're like, I can afford that. You take the item to the cashier. You get up there, 
And they wind up telling you, oh, no, it's another zero on the end of this. I'm going somewhere that can be very helpful. So what I thought I could handle, I only discovered later on I couldn't handle it. This is how sin works. We think we can pay the price of the offense. The reality of it is the price tag on it might be deceiving. Man, I, I feel like having a, I need to have a serious counseling session in here. See, and I don't, I don't have time to unpack all this from a relationship perspective, but I'm going to throw it in for free. For those of you in serious relationships are married, understand this about women. They incubate. Like they are, wi- they, are, they are wired by God. I need y'all to hear this. Women, don't be offended by your pastor. I'm giving y'all a good Bible. She is made by God to make bigger whatever you give her. It, where my women who haven't been pregnant or ever seen somebody pregnant, right? They are wired by God. So you could give them a little seed and before you get done, that seed that is like, you can't even weigh it, before you get done, it's nine pounds. And you wondering, why are you making such a big deal about it? Because they are wired to make much of little. It, so as men, let me show this in free for men. So as men, you can never assume you can pay the price. The sweetest woman in the world to be the meanest woman in the world if you make her that way. You. So it does not remove the consequences. Here's the other thing about reconciliation. This is very important. Reconciliation is not weakness. Let me tell you what it is. It is a difficult and uncomfortable process. It is exactly the opposite of weakness. Forgiveness is strength. Oh God, I wish I had somebody paying attention tonight. When, when you, when you, because let me tell you what happens when we decide to forgive. When we decide to forgive, at the moment we decide to forgive, we don't have what's in us, we don't have what's necessary in us to forgive. You, none of us are so wired from day one to immediately forgive something. Let me tell you what happens. The moment we put on the makeup in our mind to forgive, the Spirit of God kicks in and gives me the strength and the grace necessary for me to actually forgive. So it really is a simple, it's a, it's a sign of my strength. It's not, it, it is, it is, it's not weakness. It's difficult, it's uncomfortable, but this is what I want us to grab a hold of, that if we can get this in our spirit, it'll be so powerful. And I'm so grateful, I'm not gonna tell anybody's business, but um, I have, I've had three members come to me since I've been teaching this last Tuesday, and they have all three examples of strain, estranged relationships with parents. And in the last seven days, they have been able to reconcile those relationships. So, I mean, I, that is the power of the word when we apply it to our lives. And, and, so, and so this is not weakness. This is God giving grace and strength for me to do what I can't do in my own power. So what I wanna, what I wanna deposit in us very quickly, and I have to move on, is know that the forgiving act is uncomfortable. Somebody gave me an amen. Amen. Know that it is difficult. But this is what I want you to receive. But me not forgiving you is more difficult and uncomfortable. So it is not weakness. Number six. Reconciliation, forgiveness, 
stops the destructive power of Satan in my life. Man, Satan works in darkness. He works in offense. God, this is so good. I wish somebody had taught me this years ago. I want you to grab this. Until I forgive, until I reconcile, I'm going to drive me crazy trying to understand you and what you did to me. So I wind up taking myself through a series of I wonders. And in my suspicions, I wind up making your motivation and your attitude and your heart even worse than what it really was. So while I'm trying to understand you, Satan is at work destroying me more. Because now I'm walking around making you guilty of what you didn't even think. So you, this is what you're saying to yourself. Y'all, I'm teaching right. Y'all can give me an attitude, roll your eyes if you want. I know I'm teaching right. So you walk around talking to yourself. Oh, I guess he thought I was boo-boo the fool. I guess he thought I was dumb. Meanwhile, nobody said you were dumb. But because you've not forgiven, you have set Satan's destructive power loose in your head. Then you start going back to your good times. I I guess he was doing that back when we met. Now all the good times you have have been erased. So I have to stop the destructive power. And I'm, I'm, I'm picking on relationships because God is focusing on relationships, but it could be in other areas. No, I guess they've always been stealing from me. No, somebody steal from you, you know. Meanwhile, you've known them for 10 years. I'm not, I ain't making stealing right. But they steal from you. They've known you for 10 years. You know, for nine years and three months, they bought nothing but good to you. Near the end of it, they steal something from you. You holding all on to it. And then you're like, I guess he only came in my life to steal from me. And we wind up creating a whole, a whole skit and play. A whole Tyler Perry movie. <laughs> so it stops, it, does, it stops the destructive power of Satan in my life. Number seven, forgiveness and reconciliation, this is going to be oop, ouch, is not probationary. It, 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 it's not, it's not, well, I'm, I'm going to forgive, but I'm going to see. <laughs> then you haven't forgiven. Now, don't, I don't want you to, don't confuse consequences with forgiveness and reconciliation. I can forgive you and say, but I can't rock with you no more. Right? I can do that. But I can't say, all right, we'll see. We'll see is English for un, I didn't forgive you yet. So it's not probationary. We're at number eight. It does not require us to become doormats. So kill, kill the power of people in your ear. Oh, you gonna? Because this is what will happen with other Christians. They gonna they gonna know what you've been through. Then you won't. They 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 mad at you that you forgave them. You, you trying to walk as a believer, and they're like, I can't believe you still speak to her. I can't believe. So then they talk you out. So you just going to let him be a doormat. No, reconciliation forgiveness does not mean I'm your doormat. It means I'm no longer willing to hold on. This is the ministry. This is us giving, being given the ministry 
of fixing broken relationships. Now, this is very important, what I'm about to say, this is Roman number nine. Reconciliation or forgiveness is a gift. Oh, amen, word tabernacle church. Could you get you right with God? Salvation is a gift. You can't purchase it. You can't barter it. It is freely given. This is very powerful teaching if we get it. Forgiveness at its core is a gift. By definition, I don't need to deserve it. Don't you dare look at me like you have never gifted somebody something that they didn't really deserve it, but I'm going to do this out of grace. So a lot of times our mindset is I can't forgive you because you don't deserve it. Well, God didn't, you didn't deserve it when God forgave you. So I have to see reconciliation as a gift. I have to have the ability, y'all, to offer somebody a gift. And the person I need to offer the gift to is the one who offended me because that's how gifts are set up for reconciliation in the Bible. Because while we are yet sinners, Jesus dies for us. So when I am in a season of offense, he gifts me with my greatest gift. I have to park. Y'all need to be reminded. We all need, my greatest gift is salvation. I am not given my greatest gift when I'm God's friend. I am given my greatest gift when we are in offense. So I have to have the ability to hold my greatest gift to a person that does not deserve it. That's, I'm I'm talking about the method now. So first I want to give you what reconciliation is not. Now, let me tell you what happens when we forgive, when we reconcile. This is Roman number B, right? I mean, this is a sub point B. Y'all still with me on the sheet? All right, because I'm going to give you the how-to real quick. We're almost done. Some of you don't want this teaching because you just want to be mad. (laughs) And and it's just... They already done what they did. You going to let them keep doing it to you? So let me tell you what happens when I forgive. First of all, sub point one, it sets me free to move on with my life. See, until I forgive you, God's going to be so good. Let me ask you a question. If you, if you hate them so much, why you keep taking them with you everywhere? <laughs> I'm just wondering. I mean, you can't stand them. So I want you to get this. When I don't forgive, I keep dragging you with me wherever I am. So then I can't enjoy the new thing God is doing in my life because I keep winding up in a threesome. So every time someone is now not, every time someone is being legitimate with me, decent with me, fair with me, loving with me, I can't fully enjoy it because right next to me on the other side is that offense. So in order for me to move on with my life, I have to let that go. So when I reconcile, it sets me free to move on with my life. The other thing is that it opens my relationship with God. A lot of times we can't fully hear God because we are being hindered by my unforgiveness. 
It literally is clogging my ear. It literally is keeping, it's keeping my heart hard. So when God begins to move, you know, he speaks a word in my life. But then I can't apply the word to my life. I can't receive it because my heart is hard. So then I wind up staying in a lesser situation, not because God didn't speak, but because my relationship with God wasn't open. And it wasn't open because I'm still mad at you. So then what blessing did I miss in my disobedience because of a hard heart? It's the, everybody, tell your neighbor, this is the ministry of fixing relationships. So, so it opens my relationship with God. Number three, it keeps us from becoming bitter and thus protects those around us. So, literally, I am a danger to those around me because I am not in a position to control my attitude and my bitterness, and I never know when I'm going to throw up on them because of that. So now, I'm a person who can't be trusted to be around. Number four, I'm gonna just plow through. (laughs) Number four, y'all ready? It keeps us from becoming like the person who hurt us. When I don't, when I forgive, it means I'm not like you. When I don't forgive, I'm looking at you saying, I'm just like you. So if I'm just like you, how can I be mad at who you are when I'm just who you are? But the only way I get to say I'm not like you is to not act like you. (sighs) Number five. when I, these are reasons to forgive. These are reasons to reconcile. It refuses to let the person who hurt you to have any power over your life. You don't have no more power. I've disarmed you. Can I just encourage somebody in the Lord? Take your power back. I'm going to say it again. Take your power back. I'm going to keep saying it to you, Gideon, take your power back. Power over your life, power to be who God has called you to be, power to not keep bringing it up. Take your life back. Finally, and I'm going to give you a five-step process to do this. Finally, when I reconcile, when I forgive, then the inability to forgive is a source of physical problems, a lack of energy, et cetera. That means when I forgive, I literally get healthier physically. See, let me tell you something. Stress can kill you quick as a bullet can. Stress, stress, stress will wipe you out so quick, it'll blow your mind. You, 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 you standing up fine, next thing you know, stress, take you on out of here. Why would I subject my body to the stress of not forgiving you? So I'm going to tell you, some of us can't sleep at night, don't have no energy, tired, because I won't let it go. And the weight of it is destroying me physically. So then the question becomes, Pastor, how do, I, how do I walk down this road to reconciliation? I'm going to give you a four or five step process and then we're going home. I pray the Lord will do something with all of us with this teaching. Amen. 
Is it helping at all yet? I mean, is it making sense? Is it making sense? Uh, so here's the road. Here's the road. Number one. The first thing I need to do is recall. The first thing I need to do is I need to remember the hurt. I don't need to minimize it. I don't need to make excuses about it. I need to be honest about what happened. Because let me tell you, and, and some of you will get immediately what I'm going to say. Some of you is going to connect like this week. And then you just cash at me and say thank you. So let me tell you. Have you ever, have you ever been around people for long periods of time who like to recall the same story? Have you ever been around people that as they recall the story, it changes? <laughs> Especially when it involves an offense. Because, because I have not forgiven, what happens is I wind up creating addendums to the story. So now I'm walking in an offense, not over what did happen, but what, oh, whatever I've convinced myself happened. So the first step of forgiveness and reconciliation is having an honest self-recall and evaluation and to really be honest with me about what the real deal is. So I know what the objective is. I know what I'm trying to forgive. Not what my friends remind, not what my friends added to the story. Yeah. Not all of the stuff in my ear. Well, you know, that probably happened because. Wow. So now I'm in a, I gotta be, I have to have an honest recall. That's step one. Now here's step two. The second thing I need to do is recognize. Jot down recognize. Now, this is where I'm not going to get a bunch of amens, but I should get a whole room full of them. I need to recognize that God can use the offense to promote my own spiritual growth and my own dependence upon him. So I have to recognize when I recall it, I need to recognize that it is not meant to destroy me, but it is meant for God to use it to make me a better me. And so I got to make up in my mind that through this process, God, it's going to make me better. So step two is recognize. Step three is relate. Relate. What do you mean by that, Pastor? I need to understand that there is a difference between mental forgiveness and gut forgiveness. I need to be able to relate to that person in a way to see their humanity, to see the fact that they are still one of God's creations. Because until I see them, until I can relate to them as God's creation, until I can relate to them as another person that God loves and sent, because that person I'm so mad at, Jesus also was willing to die for them. So as I relate to them, I see them in a humanity. As I see them in the humanity, then I'm no longer just in my head forgiving you because I can say I forgave you. And then the moment I see you, something rise up. So I got to see, it's my relating to you from God's perspective and position that I can now see you in your humanity and relate to you as my fellow human being. So I got to relate because if I see you as somebody unworthy of this, I'm not going to be able to do it. I got to relate to you. I got to relate to you. Now, number four, write down release. I want you to go back to what I said that this is a gift. Forgiveness is the giving of something. It is the releasing of something. When I forgive you, I am literally handing you something. Now, this is important. I can't begin to hand it to you and then when you grab it, wrestle it away from you. I have to be willing to give it to you. I have to release it. 
So whatever you do with it is your business. But I'm not tussling with you no more. Right. So so when I reflect on the wrongdoing and when I reflect on what's happened, I literally have to be willing. Let me tell you what. Let me tell you what the release is. This is the best image I can give you. It may not be a good one. Get it. Get it. For those of you who still had checks. Get a check out your checkbook. Sign it. Write their name on it. Don't put an amount and hand it to them. Let me tell you what, let me tell you what this is. Forgiveness is the releasing of how I feel and you get to determine what it costs me. (sighs) See, because we say we're gonna forgive but we wanna determine what it's gonna cost. See, we want to forgive until it costs you your best friend. We say we want to forgive until your parents say, I'm mad at you and you dumb. I got to be willing to release the blank check. (sighs) Angela said you lost the room on that one. Because forgiveness is a gift. It is the releasing of something to somebody. I gotta be willing to say there's no condition here. If I forgive you and you cuss me out an hour later, it don't matter. Because I didn't determine that I was only gonna go but so far. Here you go. You do what you wanna do with it. I'm good. So there has to be a release. Okay, y'all don't believe me. Let me get y'all Bible. For God so loved the world, stop right there. Is the whole world gonna go to heaven? So God writes a blank check, the life of Jesus, knowing that some people will never receive it and spit on him. It's a blank check, you do what you wanna do with it. That's the gift. That's the releasing of forgiveness. We're almost done. Number five. Record. Now, when I say record, I don't mean hit your your phone. I'm talking about I want to take a moment and I need to write a certificate, write a letter of forgiveness. I need to write something, record something saying, look, I forgive you. This thing is set. Yo, I'm by, yes, my forgiveness is an outward expression of forgiveness, but, but I, I, got, I need something in writing to remember. Just in case you get dumb again. I remember, I recorded that I have forgiven you. And then here's the the most difficult part, remain. That I have to stay in that state of forgiveness. That I'm not gonna let anyone pull me out of it. I'm not gonna let anything pull me out of it. That's the road to fixing broken relationships. And my prayer tonight is that we would be thoughtful and prayerful. We can't can't kiss and make up with everybody. But because don't let don't let anybody guilt trip you. Just because we have boundaries doesn't mean I'm holding on to anything. It just means I recognize who you are. I'm good. You be you. I'm going to be me. I'm good. I'm going to, I'm, but I'm going to set up some boundaries, but I'm great. I'm good. So what I want us to leave us with as we pray and go home is that I don't want to hold on to stuff. Tell your neighbor, let it go. Let it go.